that each video that is seen can be sent to a friend by touching the like button or the send button after you have viewed it and after you've worshipped. That way we extend our outreach to others. Would you do that please? Now let's pray together. O oh God of love and grace, we come to worship you. We hear your call to this time of renewal and celebration. We come before you to speak words of faithfulness, to offer our humble confession, to express joy through music, and to hear and respond to the good news that Jesus is our Savior and died and lives to be the Savior for everyone who believes in him. Love so amazing, Love so divine, we present ourselves before you with adoration, commitment, and open hearts. Please fill us and mold us, equip us and use us. For the sake of Jesus, amen. I'll be reading from Luke 7, 1 through 10, in the New International Version. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion's servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some of the elders of the Jews to him asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him, they said, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well.
please join me together as we pray unto our Lord. O God, who is the giver of all good gifts, we come to you this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, whenever we are seeing this video, and we offer to you our prayer of love and commitment. We confess, O Lord, that we struggle every day between generosity and selfishness. Lord, we have so many wants, and we have quite legitimate needs. And we're sometimes overcome by the fear that we will not have enough. And yet, when we step back and note the comfort of how we live, and what we already have, and what is at our disposal, we want to confess that we have much, and more than we need, and that you promised to supply us in our direst moments. But Lord, we also know that some of your children, brothers and sisters to us, worry every day about having enough to eat, where to sleep, and how to survive. Teach us the value of gratitude for what we have, and help us in a call to give to others and to care for the least as you care for us. This day, O oh God, we pray that you will teach us more. Help us to fathom the joy of giving and blessing one another. Help us to discover the personal satisfaction of multiplying your care by joining forces with you in giving of ourselves and yes our possessions to the family of God everywhere because we ourselves have been touched by your abundant love may we be generous for Jesus sake as he graciously has been generous with us in every way for we ask this prayer in his holy name Amen. just recruited his first disciples and healed an outcast leper. He's healed a paralyzed man 
And then he calls Levi from the tax collecting business, who then hosts a great reception for Jesus, along with a large contingency of his fellow tax gatherers. All through the episodes of calling and teaching and healing, there are always religious leaders who are watching with critical eyes what Jesus does. They grumble, raising one objection after the other, either directly to Jesus or indirectly to his followers. The disciples' first days on the job with their rabbi are filled with controversy and unexpected high-voltage tension. Jesus has pointed straight responses to all their pointed, biting questions, and he has questions for them as well. He's been scrutinized closely. These nagging critics, they don't miss much, and he doesn't either. Well, Luke tells us that he knew what they were thinking, what they were thinking about him, as he passed over the Sabbath observances, like the one forbidding healing anybody on the Sabbath. Well, Jesus heals a man with a withered hand on the day when such wholesome deeds were actually on hiatus. We know, too, that Jesus spent entire nights in prayer. He did so before major decisions, such as when he selected the twelve to be his, his apostles. And then he taught in a sermon from a level place, as Luke puts it. People came from all over Judea, Jerusalem, the Seacoast, the district of Tyre and Sidon. They gathered to hear Jesus speak and to be cured of their diseases. A long teaching session here is the short version of Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. It's found in Luke 6. Some of the same instructions for kingdom people are recorded in Luke. And then comes our story in chapter 7 of the healing of a slave or a boy servant of a centurion. Jesus has completed his sermon on the plain and there follows this episode from a distance. Jesus, the teacher, and the Roman army officer, they never meet, they never speak. It's all done through intermediaries. Actually, if you look carefully, this centurion officer never appears in the story. Jesus is in the Gentile territory, and a Gentile pagan soldier has a request. It's not altogether unlike dozens that Jesus has already responded to, but he says he has a dear and valuable slave who is so sick he's about to die. Now remember, Jesus is in Galilee, far north of the holy city of Jerusalem. This is a pagan region, and it's away from the religious establishment. There are synagogues where Jesus can go, and he does go in and out of several of them. But the more he goes in and toward heathen lands, the more he is accepted and sought out. Quite surprising, later, responses to him will be strongly divided in the holy city of Jerusalem. He will get better reception in Judea and in Samaria, and even here in Capernaum, where apparently Jesus had a home in which he could stay. Our very simple but amazing story is about a person who learned to believe. Now, God may let you and me learn to believe more fully from this incident, which seems more like a mere shaft snapshot in time. But notice how quickly the story is told. But you say... I've been a believer in Christ a long time. Is it possible, though, to be able to learn to believe deeper and with more abandonment, with more trust? I believe we know what the answer is. A lot of people who are not yet believers may think of faith as unnecessary baggage. They think they can, in fact, get along perfectly well without it. That to be truly human, we're supposed to be self-sufficient. And this is what they say, well, thank you, but I can handle this all by myself. And they live their lives out of this unfaith posture. But in this narrative in Luke chapter 7, there's a man in charge of others who learns about Jesus and what he can do. So this centurion dares to ask Jesus that he might learn to believe. The centurion has a slave or a boy servant, and he's at the point of death. He probably thinks about him day and night and he's left his side to run up to Capernaum to get somebody to ask Jesus for a miracle, to stop what's going on and to do what is needed to get come by the slave and help him. You know, this is an urgent moment. There's not a second to waste. 
This is the time of heavy burden. Pain is real. His own special servant is about to lose his life. And so the man dares to ask Jesus for help. And yet he probably knows very little about Jesus. He is not a believer in the sense that he is convinced that Jesus is the Son of God or anything like that. But he dares very earnestly to count on Jesus. Why? We're not told. Verse 3 says, when he heard about Jesus, well, how did he know? Who told him? And what exactly did they tell this man? The text never tells us. There's a lot of places in the New Testament where people hear about Jesus from unnamed witnesses. And this is another one. But the text does tell us that he sent elders to the Jews with his plea for help, and they tell him, actually, they urge Jesus to come. And they have a solid rationale for asking. What is it? They say, this man is worthy or deserves to have this done for him. He loves our nation. You know, he's the man who built our synagogue in Capernaum. Well, the centurion never says these things. It's the elders of the Jews that tell this about him. But we do know this centurion is childlike enough in his faith to admit that he needs help and that he needs help from God. And so he sent emissaries to ask for help. He may not know exactly who Jesus is, but he gets the word to Jesus. And so it is, he gets what he's expecting in just a moment. Please heal my servant. Verse 6 tells us, that Jesus went with the Jewish elders, and he's on the route to his house. When he's not far from the house, the centurion sent some friends, and who they are were not told, to give Jesus a second message. These friends speak on his behalf. They do just as the elders had done to get Jesus to go to begin with. The centurion's message to Jesus is this, Lord, do not trouble yourself to me. I'm not worthy that you could come under my roof. And so I didn't presume myself worthy even to come to you. Can you hear the genuine humility of this man? The honest respect? The elders had said he was worthy of Jesus' miracle power. He says, no, I'm not. Then notice what's said. Here's the crux of the issue. It's the heart of the story. It's found in verses 7 and 8. Simply speak the word and let my servant be cured, is what he says. You know, it's like a prayer request, but it's from a distance. The centurion and Jesus never meet eye to eye. They never talk directly to one another in this episode. It's all transpiring between other people who speak on their behalf. But you know, authentic, exploring, growing faith is evident here. Here's a person who's learning to believe. He knows he's not self-sufficient. He's saying, I can't handle this by myself. He's a man in charge of 100 other men and a man of authority. When he says jump, 100 guys say, how high, sir? All he has to do is say go, and the people go. All he has to do is say come, and the people come to him. All he has to do to his servant is say, you do this, and it's as good as done. And here, the centurion's not so much asking for himself as he's asking for a young slave who has zero power or authority, no influence. His desire is pure and unselfish, and faith shines through it all. And Jesus sees it. Jesus does have the authority under heaven and earth to do anything. Some friends of a Roman soldier deliver a message requesting healing, and they know he can do something about it. Jesus does perform miracles. We know that from so many places in scriptures. They can do it again. But Jesus will reject the role of wonder worker. He carefully avoids the spectacular, but the element of compassion, well, that's another matter. He's more interested in people's faith, in opening up spiritually blind eyes, in unstopping spiritually deaf ears, in making people who are ill well. You know, it's this mixing of Jesus' compassion and others' trust in him that makes this particular story so powerful and memorable. We read it and we're drawn to him. For he is that way with us and desires that we be that way with him too. Jesus listens to the friend's message. And he is astounded at what he hears. 
Jesus doesn't just act or do or talk or touch. Sometimes what he is doing is listening or watching or taking it in. He's observing how we act. He's scrutinizing us. He's checking us out rather carefully. Do you find this true for you? I do. Jesus is amazed and he tells the crowd that followed him, I have not found faith in a single case in Israel as great as this man's. So we come to the story at the end of it. Verse 10 is the quiet closing. It's curious in some ways if you look at it. It's stated sort of matter of fact. There's no response recorded on anybody's part. It's just open-ended. But then again, we did see and hear a faith response. The centurion does believe that Jesus can heal. Simply say the word and let my servant be made well. All he needs, he says, is Jesus' words. He believed that Jesus could meet this difficult challenge, and it's all from a distance. Now that's the secret of real, authentic, growing, alive faith. A pagan has discovered Christ. He even calls him Lord. He's met the Son of God before he even laid eyes on him. He has grounded his confidence in a word from Jesus. Now isn't that how it is with us too? We've not seen him, and yet we believe. God really happened to the centurion, and God has happened to us. Just think about it. We have something beautifully in common with this Roman leader. We've not seen Jesus with our own eyes, but we believe. You know, that's what happened to Thomas at the end of John's Gospel. He saw Jesus, and then he believed, but others have never seen him. As I said at the start, this is the story of a man who learned to believe from a distance. God lets us learn to trust him in the very same way. Isn't that amazing? worship together, hear these words of blessing. Trust in the Father's love. Live in the ways of Christ. Feel the Spirit's comfort and his counsel. Serve as faith partners in God's world. And know that we can do all things through Christ, who strengthens us. Amen.